Roberto Haberman and the Origins of Modern Mexico's Jewish Community, by American labor union activist Dan Labatz, an active member of the Socialist Party USA and Democratic Socialists of America. Roberto Haberman had a remarkable career. A Jewish immigrant from Romania, a U.S. citizen, and a Mexican politician, he was a pharmacist, attorney, an advertising man, a radical journalist and a left-wing socialist, he became an advisor to Felipe Carrillo, the socialist governor of the Yucatan, an assistant to Luis N. Morones, the notoriously corrupt leader of the Mexican labor movement, and an intimate of Plutarco Elias Calas, the president of Mexico. Haberman was also one of the most important and influential Jews in modern Mexico. As a member of the highest echelons of Mexico's Class A Politica, Haberman put forward a scheme for Jewish colonization in Mexico at just about the time that Jewish immigration to the United States was substantially reduced by the imposition of nationality quotas. President Calles embraced the idea and invited Jews to settle in Mexico, leading to the wave of Jewish immigration which created Mexico's modern Jewish community. Surprisingly, no historian, so far as I am aware, has ever before drawn attention to Haberman's crucial role in these developments. Precisely because he was involved in Mexico's revolutionary nationalist government, Haberman was scrutinized by the United States intelligence services. For more than 30 years, he was under surveillance and investigation by agents of the FBI and the Military Intelligence Division, MID. Over the years, the FBI accused him of virtually everything. In 1918, it suspected him of activities favorable to the central empires. In 1920, the FBI said Haberman was considered particularly dangerous and important by representatives of the State Department and the Military Intelligence Division. In 1921, an FBI agent reported that the radicals say he is a Secret Service agent of the American Federation of Labor, an instrument of Samuel Gompers. An FBI memo of 1922 described him as an intellectual, a Bolshevist of extreme tendencies, a charter member of the Communist Party of Mexico. Haberman was suspected of draft evasion and investigated by the FBI during the First World War, though he had not evaded the draft and had in fact registered for it even though he was above draft age at the time of the Great War. He was investigated for the illegal use of a railroad pass though the truth of the matter was that he generally traveled gratis on Mexican railroads and perhaps on U.S. railroads with a pass issued by Morones. He was investigated for violation of the White Slave Traffic Act, or Man Act, because he had crossed the border with Mexican women whom he described as his secretaries and who may have been his intimate companions, though it is highly unlikely they were prostitutes. He was investigated for possibly running a business in bogus Mexican divorces, though an investigation indicated that the divorces he had obtained were legitimate. He was not guilty of everything of which he was accused which is not to say he was an innocent. Whatever injustice may have been done to Haberman by the MID and FBI spying, the memoranda, letters, and reports of these two intelligence agencies have left us with an interesting if no doubt rather jaundiced record of his life. The Young Immigrant in July of 1917, Robert Haberman was stopped in New Orleans and questioned about his recent trip to Mexico by FBI agent John B. Murphy. The loquacious, and perhaps anxious, Haberman told him his life story. Haberman was born on March 22, 1882, in Jassy, Romania, and immigrated to the United States with his family. They sailed from Rotterdam on the SS Rotterdam, arriving in the port of New York on May 13, 1901. Haberman was 19 years old and apparently looking for adventure, for on December 6, 1901, he enlisted in the U.S. Army Hospital Corps. The fact that he served in the Hospital Corps suggests that Haberman may already have been a socialist or a pacifist, though perhaps he simply wanted to gain experience with an eye to a career in medicine. Within a year, he had risen to the rank of sergeant, the same rank he held when he was discharged in 1904. His service in the U.S. Army entitled him to citizenship, and on January 5th or 11th of 1905, he was naturalized by showing his army discharge in the United States District Court in Brooklyn. Apparently, he had learned something about pharmacy while in the hospital corps, 
for when he left the service he passed the pharmacy examinations of the California State Board of Pharmacy and the New York Civil Service Commission, subsequently working as a pharmacist in both of those states. Haberman studied law at the Brooklyn Law School, which was then part of St. Lawrence University, and received an LLB degree in 1912. He then went on to New York University, where he received a law degree in 1916. Now both a pharmacist and a lawyer, he was in a position to earn a living and support a family. Sometime in 1910 Haberman met and began to keep the company of Brunden Thorberg, a Swedish immigrant who was studying at Barnard College, from which she graduated in 1906. Haberman went to Fresno, California, in 1912 to practice law, and perhaps also to be near Brunden, who was studying at the University of California in Berkeley, where she received her M.S. degree in 1913. Returning to the East Coast, Haberman and Thorberg were married in New York on October 30, 1914. An FBI agent would later write, Haberman's wife is a biology teacher in a New York high school, and judging from her letters to him is a woman of more than ordinary attainment. That same year Haberman went to work for Joseph Elner Company, Limited, Advertising Specialists, a firm often involved with left-wing causes. He apparently got the job because he had previously been on the advertising staff of the New York Call, a socialist newspaper. Haberman must have been quite active in the socialist movement, for not only was he associated with the Call, but FBI records indicate that he stood as the socialist candidate for a New York judgeship in 1916. Revolution in the Yucatan During these years, the Mexican Revolution, which had broken out in 1910, was an important issue in American politics especially since President Woodrow Wilson had sent troops to Mexico on two occasions. The socialist movement in the United States took a great interest in the revolution, supporting its radical wing and actively opposing American intervention. One area of particular interest to American socialists was the Yucatan, at the time a virtual colony of the International Harvester Company, producing henequen fiber which was used to make binder twine for harvesting machines. Not surprising. Haberman, as an active socialist, was directly involved in some of these matters. When questioned by Murphy of the FBI in New Orleans in 1917, Haberman explained his trip to Mexico in this way. He had a conversation in the Civic Club in New York with Modento, i.e., Modesto, Roland, a Mexican engineer about the value of exploiting Mexico, especially Yucatan. The discussion developed to a point where Roland offered to arrange matters so that Haberman could go to the Yucatan at the expense of the Hennequin Commission, get data about the country, come back to the United States and write up his observations for the commission for their use in inducing colonists to settle in Yucatan. Haberman accepted this offer, at the same time hoping to be able to get at least part of the commission's advertising account for the Elner Company. He left New York on April 19, 1917 on the SS Monterey of the Ward Line without waiting to get his American passport, which he had applied for at No. 2 Hector, i.e., Rector, Street, New York, having only a passport issued by but not signed by the Mexican Consul General at New York. He is now on his way back to New York, he states, with notes and photographs covering his trip, as well as a number of copies of La Voz de Revolution, a Mexican socialist newspaper which he says he intends to use for reference, it being the only newspaper of any account published in the Yucatan. In explaining his socialist views, Haberman stated that he himself is a socialist of a constructive type and not a destructive anarchist. Haberman then went on to tell Murphy a little about his experiences in the Yucatan. Haberman further stated that in Yucatan he had been on good terms with the American consul, O.O. O. Marsh but that he had had altercations with some younger Americans down there about the war, in which he had accused them of being slackers for having run down to Mexico for the obvious purpose of escaping conscription. It is his belief that these men reported him to the consul as a spy to get back at him. There were a large number of so-called slackers in Mexico at the time, some of whom were simply evading military service, while others were pacifist and socialist opponents of the war. It seems odd that Haberman would have found himself involved in altercations and recriminations with the slackers, who would have been just his kind of people. It may have been a story Haberman fabricated in an attempt to ingratiate himself with the U.S. government and portray himself as a loyal American veteran.
In any case, FBI agent Murphy believed there is nothing to indicate he is a German agent. U.S. Consul Marsh certainly remembered Haberman's stay in the Yucatan and reported it to the Office of Naval Intelligence. He also wrote to the Secretary of State that Haberman was a rather mysterious American of Romanian origin. I am inclined to believe. He is poor, sincere, and honest but disposed to place the principles of socialism over any established government including his own, the U.S. Later Marsh changed his opinion of Haberman, describing him in another letter to the Secretary of State as a pernicious foreigner who had become a dangerous character. Haberman may really have gone to the Yucatan to investigate the Hennekin situation and do some work for the Elner Advertising Company, as he claimed, but it is likely that these activities were a cover for international solidarity work for the Socialist Party. In any case, while in the Yucatan he was swept up in the Mexican Revolution. He established contact with the revolutionary government led by Socialist Felipe Carrillo Puerto, and in 1918, when Haberman returned to the Yucatan, Carrillo hired him as an advisor to help create a system of consumer and producer cooperatives for the League of Resistance, the Yucatan's Peasant Revolutionary Army. By 1919 Haberman had been named Inspector General of Cooperatives and put in charge of the operation. In April of 1918 the U.S. Postal Censorship intercepted a letter from Haberman to his wife in which he told her about his activities. He had been just been to the first Socialist Workers' Conference, held in Merida, he wrote, where he spoke for the cooperatives and for a socialist normal school. At that same meeting a motion for women's suffrage was passed, as well as support for the use of general strikes, boycotts, and sabotage as measures for defense against the counter-revolution. Haberman enclosed an article for the call entitled, With the Bolsheviks of Yucatan. In fact, Haberman played an important role at the conference. He headed the Commission on Agricultural Cooperatives and was a member of both the Commission on Social Well-Being and the Commission to Create a Socialist Normal School. During that period, Haberman was quite involved in education in the Yucatan as a promoter of the anarchist Ferrer's theory of rational education. José Vasconcelos, the famous Mexican philosopher and minister of education, wrote in his memoir El Desastre that the Jew Haberman from the New York ghetto had had the staff end their meetings by shouting, Long live the devil, death to God. Vasconcelos, who came to hate Calles, Morones, and Haberman, may have fabricated the slogan, Long live the devil, but death to God, was certainly in keeping with the anarchist philosophy and the anti-clerical sentiments of the Mexican Revolution. Labor agitator and educator in Mexico City in 1919 or 1920, Haberman left the Felipe Carrillo government in the Yucatan and went to Mexico City. The socialist journalist Carlton Beals was there at the time and remembered Haberman in his memoir Glass Houses, Ten Years of Freelancing. Roberto Haberman, looking for a place to land, found it with Morones. Having planned for some time to leave for Europe, I had turned over to Roberto the English Institute which he ran between the hours when working at the American drugstore as clerk and pharmacist. He wanted to get into local politics and chuck both jobs. Morones gave him his chance. Haberman, of Romanian Jewish origin, had been a California lawyer I had known his brother-in-law out there and was now married to a very handsome, tall, Swedish girl named Thorberg. Haberman had come to Mexico for the Hindus who wanted to start a land colony in Yucatan then famed as a sort of socialist utopia. In Yucatan, he soon got on well with Felipe Carrillo and was put in charge of the cooperative stores of the Liga de Resistencia. But when Mexican President Carranza menaced Carrillo's position in the state, Haberman had to get out and came up to Mexico City. Soon after the Obregón Revolution, he paid a call on Morones, whom previously he had considered something of a shyster, and came back a complete convert. From then on, he was very intimate with Morones and soon became a prominent liaison officer between him and Gompers of the American Federation of Labor. Luis N. Morones, formerly a leader of the Electrical Workers' Union and of the anarchist House of the World Worker, had in 1918 founded the Regional Confederation of Mexican Workers, CROM, which, with the support of Presidents Carranza, Obregón, and Calles, became a state-sponsored quasi-official labor federation. Morones also served in the government, first heading the National Munitions Works and the Army Purchasing Department and then as Secretary of Industry, Commerce, and Labor in several cabinets.
After the presidents themselves, Morones was the most important man in Mexican politics. While spouting the rhetoric of anarcho syndicalism, Morones used his labor union office and political positions to become immensely wealthy and was notorious for his orgies. In choosing to go to work for Morones, Haberman had made a momentous, opportunistic decision to break with his radical past, for throughout the early 20s, Morones's Yellow Trade Union Federation was engaged in a frequently violent struggle with the anarchist and communist Red Labor Unions for control of the workers' movement. In taking up with Mexico's new revolutionary nationalist establishment, Haberman assured himself not only of employment but also of a substantial salary and the perquisites of office, which could be lucrative. With his energy, ambition, talent, experience, knowledge of languages, Romanian, English, Spanish, and some French and German, and ties to U.S. socialist and labor circles, Haberman soon created a role for himself and became part of the inner circle of the ruling elite. He was to remain true to this political choice and loyal to the Mexican state to the end of his life. Through his newly established connections with Morones, Haberman was appointed the head of the Foreign Language Department of the Ministry of Education, then headed by Vasconcelos. Haberman was also employed by the Secretary of Agriculture as a translator. In addition to his government jobs, Haberman was a director of the Institute of Social Science, as well as a professor at the National University of Mexico. For a brief time in the 1920s, Haberman played an important role in the development of public education in Mexico City. As head of the Foreign Language Department, he could also find jobs for friends and family members. Beals remembered that in 1923, immediate financial worries were solved for me by Roberto Haberman, at that time in charge of the language department of the public schools. He put me in charge of two English classes, one in Colonia Vallejo, a very poor district north of the city, the other in a large commercial school for girls. Haberman also found a job for his nephew Basilio Iliesco, a decision he would later regret. Haberman's services to Morones were politically more important than his educational work. Morones received support for his yellow labor union from Samuel Gompers, the head of the American Federation of Labor. When Gompers and Morones held meetings of the Pan American Labor Movement, it was Haberman who acted as the translator and go between. Jose Allen, the head of the Mexican Communist Party and also a secret agent for U.S. military intelligence, wrote a report on the Mexican left in 1921 in which he gave quite a subtle and insightful description of Haberman. While Haberman is an active socialist and sincere, he is not anti-American and on the contrary is distinctly friendly with many leaders of the American Federation of Labor. He helped Morones, Kid, Gompers but is too much of an opportunist to do anything against the U.S. government. Friendly relations with Haberman might be established to good advantage by proper parties and would be the most effective tactics to use in dealing with him. A connection between the U.S. government and Haberman might well have been mutually beneficial. In 1921, in his capacity as a representative of Morones and the Mexican labor movement, Haberman paid a visit to J. Edgar Hoover, at the time the number two man of the FBI, and later its head. Haberman was taken to Hoover by E. C. Davison, the General Secretary of the International Association of Machinists, IAM, one of the most important unions in the AFL. Haberman's mission in speaking with Hoover was to obtain FBI help in suppressing the growing communist threat to Morones's labor organization. Hoover reported, I gather from the statement of Mr. Davison and Haberman that Haberman was a member of the International Machinists Union, SIC and that one of his duties was to keep the central organization informed of radical elements within that body. He, Haberman, claims to have been directly responsible for the deportation by Obregón of some of the leading Mexican radicals. He stated that Gompers, Morones and himself have been subjected for many months to vicious verbal assaults by the communists in Mexico, to which they paid little or no attention until direct evidence was obtained that these communists had voted upon a course of action for the purpose of assassinating the leading Pan-American labor leaders. Neither Mexican nor American communists engaged in political assassination in the early 1920s and it is most likely that the story of the plot to kill Gompers and Morones was a rather sophisticated attempt by Haberman to get the U.S. government to help Morones crush the communists 
who at that particular moment were stronger than the Krom. Intrigue, espionage, provocation, and sophisticated police agentry generally seem to have been Haberman's midier. Through his association with Morones, Haberman also became intimately acquainted with Mexican presidents Alvaro Obregón and Plutarco Elias Calles. As an insider in the Class A Politica, the highest level of the government, Haberman was in a position to offer advice and make suggestions on a variety of issues. In the early 1920s he made a suggestion which was to have a significant impact on Mexico's Jewish community. The promotion of Jewish colonization. In late 1922, while visiting New York City, Haberman was interviewed by S. O. Dingle, a Jewish journalist. Dingle's article about him appeared in the Texas Jewish Herald on November 30, 1922. It said in part, Senor Haberman is a Jew and, although an American citizen, he has been for the past six years an official of the Mexican government, having spent part of his time in the Department of Agriculture. What is more, he is greatly interested in the possibility of Jewish colonization in Mexico. The idea first occurred to him when the Russian sect of Mennonites settled in Mexico about a year ago. Senor Haberman was then active in drawing up their contract with the Mexican government, in accordance with the terms of which they received the following concessions. Land, no compulsory military service even during war, official language to be one of their own selection, schools of their own, free railroad transportation for immigrants from the Mexican border to the colony, agricultural implements and other material brought from abroad for building up their colony to be admitted free of duty, railroad freight charges to be only 5% of the normal rates. This gave Senor Haberman an idea that a Jewish colony in Mexico, on similar conditions, would not be a bad thing. The Jews would be free to choose their own language, Yiddish or Hebrew, they would have their own schools and might be able to secure other important concessions. Dingle discusses the climate. With the latest agricultural machinery and with the assistance of experts, it will be easy for every Jew to become a farmer. And should the Jews engage one half of the necessary number of experts to teach them farming, it is Senor Haberman's opinion that the Mexican government will come to their assistance and engage the other half at its own expense. There is no anti-Semitism to speak of in Mexico. Although it is true that the Mexicans use the word Judas to denote anyone that is not straight in his dealings, nevertheless, there is nothing anti-Jewish about it. The average Mexican is of a friendly disposition and the Mexican government is a genuine people's government. When the idea of Jewish colonization first occurred to Senor Haberman, he took it up with General Calles, the Mexican premier. He told him that outside of other concessions, the Mexican government would have to free the Jewish immigrants of the $10 head tax, which Mexico charges for a visa, because $10 for a Jewish immigrant from Europe is a very big sum of money. The premier was very sympathetic with the ideas and told Senor Haberman that all these things could be easily arranged. Senor Haberman is therefore convinced that if a responsible Jewish organization should apply to the Mexican government with a plan for Jewish settlement in the country, many concessions will be obtained. Haberman advised Jews to come to Mexico and produce consumer goods, such as clothes and shoes, and household furniture. Factories and business firms producing and dealing in these commodities stand a very good chance for success in Mexico. Why had Haberman made the proposal of Jewish immigration? Certainly he had not theretofore expressed much interest in his Jewish heritage, nor is it likely that his Jewish origins played much of a role in his thinking in 1922. He was, rather, giving expression to the interests of Mexico's revolutionary nationalist government. First, Mexico had lost more than 800,000 people through war, malnutrition, and starvation during the ten years after the outbreak of the revolution in 1910. Second, some industrialists and businessmen, particularly those associated with the regime of the dictator Porfirio Diaz, had fled the country. Third, during the presidencies of Wilson and Harding, that is, from 1916 through 1924, the United States was in a prolonged confrontation with Mexico that twice involved military intervention. No doubt Haberman expected that an invitation to the persecuted Jews of Europe to come settle in Mexico would enhance Mexico's reputation abroad and help to improve its position vis-a-vis -vis the United States.
But perhaps the most important factor was the United States Immigration Law of 1921, which imposed quotas dramatically curtailing Jewish immigration. Haberman and Callas could expect that some of the Jews who would have gone to the United States before the passage of the law might now be willing to settle in Mexico, especially if encouraged with concessions like those he suggested. In August of 1924, Callas, then president-elect, took up Haberman's suggestion and made a public statement inviting Jews to colonize Mexico. I am very warmly interested in the situation of the thousands of Jewish immigrants stranded in Europe, said Callas, and I have already been in conference with several American Jewish organizations who seek to solve the problem of the refugees. In response to this invitation, the Emergency Committee on Jewish Refugees, headed at the time by Louis Marshall, sent a commission consisting of Dr. Maurice B. Hextel, the executive director of the Federated Jewish Charities of Boston, and Charles E. Assize of Philadelphia to investigate the wisdom of supporting Jewish colonization in Mexico. Upon their return, Dr. Hexter wrote a report with the straightforward title The Jews in Mexico. In the introduction to his report, Dr. Hexter alluded to the services of a unique personality, the humanitarian Roberto Haberman, a fellow Jew, as well as to a meeting with cabinet member Luis N. Morones. Hexter then went on to analyze the situation in Mexico and its prospects for Jewish colonists. Giving some historical background, he pointed out that because of the Catholic Inquisition, which lasted into the 19th century, few Jews had settled in Mexico. Hexter noted that he had been told by Dr. Sidney Ulfelder, a Mexican physician, that before the war there were not more than 75 Jewish families and a small number of single men in the entire country. These families had come from the United States, Austria, Germany, and Alsace-Lorraine. In addition, Hexter explained, there also arrived before the war a rather sizable number of Levantine Jews. The heavy influx of Jews started in 1921. At that time and for several months, every German, French or Dutch passenger liner carried to Veracruz from 500 to 1,000 Jewish immigrants, coming mostly from Russia, Ukraine, and from Hungary. He quotes a reliable and hospitable eyewitness as saying, it was the most miserable class of immigrants, destitute of any means of living, in health conditions defying description, in dire need of assistance, and in utmost despair, spending days and nights on the streets and squares of Veracruz and of Mexico City. Many of these immigrants found their way to the border towns and the coasts. Hexter estimated that there were 8,000 Jews in Mexico City and another 1,325 in other cities and towns. Many were peddlers, though there were also farmers, artisans, workers, and some professionals. In his assessment of the prospects for Jews in Mexico, Hexter was completely pessimistic and strongly recommended against agricultural or urban colonization. He argued that agricultural colonization was unrealistic, given the lack of a large area of fertile country and of markets, the inadequacy of the railroads and other means of transportation, and the impossibility of competing with peon labor. As for urban employment, Hexter argued that Mexico's few cities simply could not absorb more peddlers, artisans, and mechanics. Nor was there adequate social support or philanthropic endeavors to support the Jewish immigrants who might wend their weary way to Mexico. Finally, he rejected Haberman's argument that there was no anti-Jewish animus in Mexico, quoting some viciously anti-Semitic newspaper articles that had recently attacked the Jewish immigration proposal. In conclusion, said Hexter, the writer is firmly and irrevocably convinced that colonization in Mexico should not only not be encouraged but should definitely and firmly be discouraged. The writer has not met with any investigator or student of the subject of Jewish immigration to Mexico who is prepared to recommend otherwise. Even Roberto Haberman believes such a project to be hopeless. Despite Hexter's extremely discouraging report, and partly as a result of President Calas's invitation, between 300 and 500 Jews arrived in Mexico each month of 1924 and 1925. As one historian wrote, it was during these years that the Mexican Jewish community began to take definite form. In the course of his report, Hexter made, in a rather offhand way, what seems like a really remarkable claim that might offer another explanation for the Calas invitation. It is fairly reliably determined that the idealist and Mexican president, 
Francisco I. Madero was a direct descendant of the Levantine Jewish migration, and it was repeatedly told to us that the present president Calles is of this same migration. If Calles was himself Jewish, he might well have had a special personal interest in Jewish immigration. With that said, at the same time the Mexican president Calles, a Freemason and possible crypto-Jew of Spanish Sephardic Morano descent, was inviting Jews from Eastern Europe into Mexico by the thousands with open arms, he was simultaneously oppressing and persecuting Mexico's Catholic communities with his anti-clerical reforms and legislation called the Calles Law. Added to Mexico's new constitution after the Mexican Revolution, which enacted a number of anti-clerical provisions, which led to a Catholic revolt and conflict known as the Cristeros War. President Calles used both police and military to arrest priests, nuns, bishops, and other members of the clergy and faithful Catholic civilians, then executed them by lynching and or firing squads. Their corpses were then publicly displayed from trees, along train tracks, streets, and highways. On May 28, 1926, Calles was awarded a Medal of Merit from the head of Mexico's Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for his actions against the Catholics. There is a direct correlation between the Mexican Revolution of 1910 to 1920 and the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939 as both socio-political revolutionary upheavals were planned, plotted, implemented, and perpetrated by the same confederation of Freemasons, Jews, Marxists, Socialists, Anarchists, and other radical far-left scum, all of which were anti-Christian. Is it any wonder why Jewish Bolshevik terrorist Leon Trotsky is buried in Mexico with an honorary monument and his former residence now converted into a Trotsky Museum. Moreover, there's a very good chance that Mexico City's far-left pro-tranny Jewish mayor, Claudia Scheinbaum, will be Mexico's next president. In fact, at the moment of making this video, she resigned as mayor on June 16, 2023 to enter the primary race for the 2024 presidential election in Mexico, resulting in North America being completely ruled by the Jewish tribal cabal. Democracy is a Jewish dictatorship. This Jewish conspiracy includes the entire Jew-ridden Biden administration in America, Justin Trudeau, bastard son of the self-described crypto-Jew Fidel Castro in Canada, and soon Scheinbaum's guaranteed presidential election in Mexico. The Jewish Trilogy of Terror will be complete. Things are about to get a lot worse for the rest of us. Anyhow, on with the rest of the story. His Personal Life in Disarray Throughout the 1920s, Haberman led quite a full life, working for two government ministries and for Morones's crime unions in Mexico and traveling frequently to the United States, often in the company of young women. No doubt this lifestyle put a great deal of stress on his family life. On November 15, 1922, Haberman passed through El Paso, Texas, on the way from Mexico City to Los Angeles. FBI agent Louis Dinette made contact with him there and during the two-hour conversation that ensued Haberman revealed the very personal reasons for his trip to the United States. Haberman told Dinette, about June 4, 1922, while I was in New York looking after a Hennequin deal for the planters of Yucatan, my wife ran away from Mexico City with Basilio Iliesco, my nephew, whom I had brought to Mexico, given a good position in the Department of Education, permitted to live in my own home and treated with utmost kindness, which he repaid by ruining my home. They went to Los Angeles, California. They took my little boy, aged four years. When I returned to Mexico after completing the Hennequin deal, I was absolutely dumbfounded. I at once instituted inquiry and after some time learned that they were in Los Angeles. I obtained a leave of absence from my department and went to Los Angeles to recover my boy if possible. I found my wife and Iliesco in poverty, Iliesco having pawned all her clothing. 
I have given my wife a month to make up her mind whether to return to Mexico City or to stay with her lover. If she returns I will see that she is provided for and I will take care of the boy, but I shall never resume marital relations with her. As for Iliesco, he made a false affidavit when he entered the United States, to the effect that he was a Mexican citizen when, in truth, he is Romanian. These facts have been given the American immigration authorities at Los Angeles. Haberman was not the kind of man to remain alone for long, and on February 26, 1926, he married a Mexican woman, Esperanza Dominguez. An FBI agent who questioned her said she was unable to give an intelligent explanation of her husband's activities. But then, who could? The divorce business. By the early 1930s the Crom labor movement was in decline, and Calas, the jefe maximo of the revolution, was being eclipsed by General Lazaro Cardenas. Haberman was no longer at the center of the Mexican Revolution, and with the decline of his faction would be moved to the periphery. While still involved in the labor movement and the government, he now seems to have spent more of his energies on his law practice, specializing in divorce. In 1934 he maintained an office in New York City at 66 Fifth Avenue and was listed in the phone directory as a Mexican attorney. Another attorney engaged in litigation in Mexico, a Mr. Schuster of Schuster and Foy, described Haberman to an FBI agent. Haberman, he said, is a man probably 50 years of age, 5 feet 8 inches in height, weighing 150 to 160 pounds, stocky build, gray hair and clean shaven. He possesses, no doubt considerable ability is a good talker and a man of more or less attractive personality and is well known to people in Mexican circles. Haberman had written a book, The Divorce Laws of Mexico, with appendices including decisions of local jurisdictions in the United States with respect to foreign decrees, which had seen two editions. Still eager to pin something on Haberman, the FBI tried, without success, to make a case that he was selling bogus divorces. After the abortive Calas rebellion against Cardenas in 1935, Calas, Morones, and their associates were no longer welcome in Mexico. Haberman, being so close to Morones, must also have been forced to leave Mexico at least until 1940, and probably worked as a divorce lawyer in New York during those years. After World War II, Mexico turned in a more conservative direction, and from 1948 until his retirement, Haberman helped to organize the social security program instituted by President Miguel Aleman Valdez. At some point Haberman returned to the United States, and in 1962 he died in the Veterans Administration Hospital in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Haberman was survived by his third wife, the former Suzanne Fike Sackett, his son Robert Jr., and a sister, Mrs. Ray Nickel. Haberman was typical of a generation of Eastern European Jews who were involved in socialist and nationalist revolutions around the world. They were active in labor unions, the Arbeiter Ring, Workmen's Circle, Poale Zion, anarchist groups, and the Socialist and Communist Parties. Men and women of Haberman's stamp were familiar figures in Europe and the United States, but in Mexico, where Spaniards or native-born Americans usually played the role of foreign agitator, he was rather a rarity. Yet in some ways Roberto Haberman, the Jewish, Romanian, American radical, became a loyal Mexican nationalist. The bond was forged when he seized an opportunity in a moment of desperation, grasping the strong but dirty hand of Morones and in all the years thereafter never letting it go. Ironically, his relationship to the corrupt Morones made it possible for him to influence the course of Jewish history. During the most active years of his life, Haberman was first a socialist and then a Mexican nationalist, and probably attached little importance to his Jewish heritage. Most likely none of his three wives were Jewish, and so, of course, neither was his son. When Haberman took an interest in Jewish colonization in the early 1920s, it was probably primarily out of Mexican nationalist motives, and only incidentally related to his own Jewish background. Yet, whatever the motives, his call for Jewish colonization led to the wave of Jewish immigration that helped to create Mexico's modern Jewish community. Dan Labatz is a graduate student in the History Department at the University of Cincinnati. Before that, he was a union organizer in Chicago and Kentucky. He is the author of The Crisis of Mexican Labor, 1988, 
and Rank-and-File Rebellion, Teamsters for a Democratic Union, 1990. Addendum from Wikipedia Violent Church-State Conflict From main article, Cristero War Calais was a staunch anti-clerical and during his term as president, he moved to enforce the anti-clerical articles of the Constitution of 1917, which led to a violent and lengthy conflict known as the Cristero Rebellion or the Cristero War, which was characterized by reprisals and counter-reprisals. The Mexican government violently persecuted the clergy, massacring suspected Cristeros and their supporters. In May 1926, Calles was awarded a Medal of Merit from the head of Mexico's Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in recognition of his actions against the Catholic Church. The following month, on June 14, 1926, President Calles enacted anti-clerical legislation known formally as the Law of Reforming the Penal Code and unofficially as the Calles Law. His anti-Catholic actions included outlawing religious orders, depriving the church of property rights, and depriving the clergy of civil liberties, including the right to trial by jury in cases involving anti-clerical laws, and the right to vote. Catholic antipathy towards Calais was enhanced because of his vociferous anti-Catholicism. Due to Calais's strict and sometimes violent enforcement of anti-clerical laws, people in strongly Catholic areas, especially the states of Jalisco, Zacatecas, Guanajito, Colima, and Mecoacan began to oppose him, and on January 1, 1927, a war cry went up from the faithful Catholics, Viva Cristo Rey! Aftermath of the Cristero War and Toll on the Church Almost 100,000 people on both sides died in the war. A truce was negotiated with the assistance of U.S. Ambassador Dwight Morrow, in which the Cristeros agreed to lay down their arms. However, Calles reneged on the terms of the truce within a few months. He had approximately 500 Cristero leaders and 5,000 other Cristeros shot, frequently in their homes in front of their wives and children. Particularly offensive to Catholics after the truce was Calles' insistence on the complete state monopoly on education, suppressing all Catholic education and introducing socialist education in its place, saying, quote, We must enter and take possession of the mind of children and the mind of youth. Unquote. The persecution continued as Calles maintained control under his Maximato and did not relent until 1940, when President Manuel Avila Camacho, a practicing Catholic, took office. The effects of Calles' policy on the church were profound. Between 1926 and 1934, at least 4,000 priests were killed or expelled. One of the most famous was the Jesuit priest Miguel Pro. Where there were 4,500 priests in Mexico prior to the rebellion, in 1934 there were only 334 priests licensed by the government to serve 15 million people, the rest having been eliminated by immigration, expulsion, execution, and assassination. By 1935, 17 states had no priests at all. The following material is from a source I have since forgotten because I'd gathered all the material for this video back in 2017 and it's taken me six years to finally get around to making it. Which is why the article mentions Obama and it also mentions a film called For the Greater Glory on the Cristero War that was released in 2012. Too bad that most relevant story points in the movie For the Greater Glory are conveniently left on the cutting room floor, for what was thrown out is the real story of the Cristada, from the 1926 Mexican Cristero War to the 1936 Spanish Civil War. For the Greater Story is an indictment of the Obama administration of fascism of communism, and of how gullible Mexicans, Spaniards, and American people get leaders who do not represent their true interests, and what tragedies these initiatives make entail, and most importantly, how Jews commit war against Christians. Told in the movie, 
is that Mexican President Calles was a secular atheist and that his secular atheism was the sole motive driving his hatred of Christianity. Many Mexicans believe this in the day and the movie audience will believe it. Although, many will not question the same secular atheism of the Cristero general who valiantly opposed President Calles and why this general did not hate Christianity but instead defended it with his life. Not told in the movie is that, like Obama, many Mexicans believe their President Calles' hatred of Christianity must be an indication that he was in truth a Muslim. His nickname was El Turco, the Turk after the Turkish abusers of Christians during the Crusades. Just like our Judeo-loving president, everyone explained Calessa's anti-Christian bloody purges by mistakenly thinking he was a Muslim, but Calessa was not a Muslim. Not told in the movie is that, like Obama, Mexicans believe their president Calessa must be a communist, and this time, at least, he was indeed a Judeo-communist. The Mexican Constitution began in 1917, the exact same time as when the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, with Mexico being the first embassy the Communists opened and the American people at the time calling the government of Calles Soviet Mexico. The ruling PRI National Mexican Party Calles created lasted as long as the Bolshevik Soviet Union. Both fell around the same time the Soviet Union fell on Christmas Day, December 25, 1991. The following year, in 1992, the PRI did not fall in fact, but it did fall in spirit. With repeal of its anti-Christian Judeo-Communist constitutional provisions, which had been the cause of the Cristeros War. On July 2, 2000, no longer a client state of the Soviet Union, an opposition party had gained enough supporters the previous eight years to enable Vicente Fox's win, which caused the first ever presidential electoral defeat of the Judeo-Communist PRI. Not told in the movie is that President Calles had Jewish roots, and that this is the real reason why he hated Christianity. This also explains why Mexico President Calles was supported by the Jewish power structure and Protestant America presented was a new Monroe Doctrine which set to destroy the Christian Catholic link in Spain's former colony to the mother country of Spain, a country Jews have loved to hate since Spain expelled Jews from Spain in 1492 AD, following their 800 year golden age of accommodation with the Moorish Muslim invaders of Spain. Because of this, many American Protestants turned their eyes and attention away from the devastation happening to fellow Christians just across the border, even as American pilots were flying the first planes to bomb the Cristeros. Not told in the movie is that Mexico's mother country of Spain would suffer the same religious civil war between Jews and Christians just 10 years later in 1936, often referred to as the Spanish Civil War. With the Federal Reserve orchestrating the Great Depression, came many desperate people who were looking for worldly salvation anywhere they could find it. Some found it in Judeo-Communism, some found the opposite in Christian Fascism. The quote, Republican Manuel Azana became Spain's President Calles, who controversially remarked, quote, that burning of all the convents in Spain was not worth the life of a single Republican, unquote. A Republican is what the Communists called themselves in Spain. In 1936, Azana began arming leftist death squad militias who then proceeded to kill businessmen, priests, and everyone else who appeared to be, quote, fascist. Thus began the Spanish religious war between Christians and Jewish useful idiots. The End